Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You know, uh, as human beings, we cannot foretell the future. That is the provenance of the divine. It's not, we can barely, we barely know what's happening next week. But to know what's happening a, a few years, a few hundred years, a few thousand years, that's we're just beyond us. Uh, and uh, the prophets in the Old Testament in particular were tested to see whether the, the prophecies they gave came true uh, early on so that their longer term prophecies could be relied upon or not. There's a, there's a clear test laid out in the Old Testament. And just for a, an example of that, actually, the greatest prophet, the Lord Jesus, prophesied in Luke 21 uh, and in other places as well, that uh, soon after he had ascended to heaven, that Jerusalem would be destroyed, that Israel would be destroyed, and destroyed to such an extent that every stone in the temple would be taken away. And he would have, he gave that prophecy in about AD 34, uh, and in AD 38, Vespasian, uh, who was the general at the time and became an emperor, as you may know, uh, started the siege of Jerusalem, and his son Titus completed that. And, and so we know that by, by that short-term prophecy, that the longer-term prophecies that Jesus gave would come true as well. That's the case here about Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the future. Now, what I want to make really clear is that Nebuchadnezzar was a real person. He existed in history. Now, and if you want to... Uh, give yourself some, some evidence of this. Uh, you can go to either the, the British Museum um, or the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, all of which have artifacts that have been uh, around uh, for two and a half thousand years. And when you just think of that for a moment, what would be left in your house after two and a half thousand years? You know, uh, it's not much, is it? And so what we, what we have left are the stone artefacts that uh, are there that talk about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, on the bottom left hand of your screen there, there's a stone obelisk which has been written on, and every line represents a year of Nebuchadnezzar's kingship. I say, you can find that stone in the British Museum. Um, it's not complete. The top half is complete is missing, um, and it, but it's written in cuneiform, which is the style of writing that uh, we were able to interpret when uh, we, we found the Rosetta Stone. Um, so we were able to actually date Nebuchadnezzar, and we know that he became emperor of Babylon in 605 BC, and he reigned for 43 years, which is quite a long time, particularly in that era, until 562 BC. And um, we have a, a vague idea of what he looked uh, like from some stone reliefs. Uh, and there are various stone reliefs that you can find in, again, in particular museums. And this is the area that he ruled over. Uh, as you can see, it goes from um, a, a big chunk of uh, Iran and Iraq, and goes right the way across to Turkey, then down uh, through Syria, the Israeli Levant, uh, and down the left-hand side of what is now Saudi Arabia. And if we put that onto a more modern map, you can see that was a huge empire. Uh, and he, he built his empire upon what had already existed. Uh, and before him, became the Assyrian Empire, which eventually uh, crumbled. His father, uh, whose name was Nebuchadnezzar, um, became king of Babylon when the Assyrian Empire fell to pieces. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar went from being a general in the Assyrian army, as was his father, to become the, the, the regent, um, the, the prince of Babylon under his father Nebuchadnezzar. But Babylon at that time was relatively small. And it was Nebuchadnezzar that built most of Babylon. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, he built it with bricks bearing his name, of which there are estimated to be about 15 million 
So, so it's really clear that this is a man uh, who existed uh, and was a brilliant general and a strong leader. That little stone cylinder on the left-hand side is uh, uh, it tells us about Nebuchadnezzar um, because in order to record their history, what they would do is make those little stone cylinders, um, have their story of their lives written on them, and then have those stone cylinders buried with them as well. So then you could tell uh, when the body had rotted away uh, and, and the areas dug up, the, these stone pillars, these, these stone cylinders uh, appear all over the place. And that's never Palasa in the right hand side there in the picture. Uh, and this is an artist's impression of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it was a huge city, it was the biggest city in the world at the time. Uh, and what you can see in blue there is the Ishtar Gate, which was built uh, to impress anybody who came into the city. Um, and they often had ceremonies where the king and his retinue would come out of the Ishtar Gate. And um, it just was built to make him look even more impressive than he actually was. And then that's rebuilt in the Pogman Museum in Berlin. There's a brick that bears Nebuchadnezzar's name. Um, and it says on that brick in cuneiform, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who cares for Eshgila and Ezida, eldest son of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Uh, and as I say, it's estimated there are 15 million of such bricks. And the reason that a lot of those artifacts are to be found in the Bogum Museum in Berlin is due to the gentleman in the right, top right hand side, Robert Johann Coldaway, uh, who in the late 19th century, did much archaeology on the ruins of Babylon. So it was a huge city, and it was built upon the wealth of not just uh, its uh, wealth, but the nations that the Babylonian Empire subjugated and taxed as well. That's absolutely fascinating. But the reason I spent so much time on that is I wanted to make it clear to you that this was a real place, and Nebuchadnezzar was a real person. Equally, the person, the person who helps him was a real person. One of the brilliant ideas that Nebuchadnezzar had was to take the brightest and the best from the nations that he subjugated, often young men, bring them back, educate them for three years, which may be where our university education comes from, and then put them into his civil service to administer it, it, not just the city, but the growing empire as well, and to invent things and so on. And he would pay them. Uh, they would become uh, well looked after slaves, like everybody else, subject actually to the whim of Nebuchadnezzar, um, because he was a, a dictatorial potentate. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar had defeated Jehoiachin in, uh, again, that's a well attested outside of the Bible, um, and Zedekiah, and had brought Daniel and uh, other Jewish captives back into, the, uh, into his city. And there we meet Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, because Nebuchadnezzar's got a problem. He's had a dream. And he remembers his dream. He knows it's important, but he doesn't want his wise men and astrologers just to kind of interpret the dream in their own style. So he's not going to tell them what it is. And he invents, therefore, the, probably the greatest employee incentive scheme known in history. And we read about it in Daniel chapter 2. I'll, I'll read this to you. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know 
the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic and said, I, I, frankly, as you would to somebody who had the power of life and death over you, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you'll be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards and great honour. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Can you imagine the panic? Because they, they knew they couldn't do it. And they said, well, you know, this is beyond us. We can't do this. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests. There is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh which is true. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now Daniel would have been a very lowly wise man, part, part of a, a retinue, a, a civil service, but of course, as soon as they start searching for them, um, he, he, he then obviously feels he needs to act. And so he asks his boss to go and speak to the king because he wouldn't have had direct access to him and uh, to say, I, my God can interpret this dream, uh, present me to the king. And we move then to verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. Your dream, the vision of your head upon your bed, were these. As you know, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. As for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than any living. But for our sakes, you make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So Daniel's saying, it's not me doing this. This is God, and only God can reveal it. And God has revealed the things that are going to happen after you. And so this is what the, the, the substance of the dream is. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, and its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. He watched while a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was. And, and so to go through that again, you can see that the head of gold, chest of and arms of silver, and then a, a belly of brass, uh, and mid rift of brass, and then two iron legs, and then feet made of iron, and feet made of clay as well. It just doesn't mix very well. That was uh, the image that was going to foretell the future. And, and happily, the dream is interpreted for us. Verse 36. 
This is a dream. Now will I will now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king, says Daniel. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. He's made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So I'm sure made Nebuchadnezzar feel pretty good. <clears throat> but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now that word inferior doesn't necessarily mean that it was less important. In fact, it was actually bigger. It just means uh, that it came after. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over the earth, and a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. And that was the uh, interpretation to that point. And in verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter, clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So that was the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And what's so amazing, what is so helpful to us all these years later, is that when we look at that image, we can see that it has come true up until the present day, where, as we can see, we have strong nations and we have weak nations. And we know what happens next, that stone cut out of the mountain without hands strikes the feet. Um, but just, just to be clear, uh, we can see the Babylonian Empire, <coughs> uh, uh, all of these empires, again, just for a point of clarity, we know the Bible is Israel-centric, uh, and these kingdoms were all Israel-centric as well. And that answers the often asked question about, well, what about Genghis Khan, who had an absolutely huge empire, or Queen Victoria? Uh, uh, who had so many countries in her empire, that it was said that the sun never set upon them, the, on the British Empire. Well, those are, weren't the ones that surrounded Israel. These were. So you had Babylon, and then you had the fall of Babylon, and then you, under Cyrus, uh, we, had, we had the Medes and the Persian Empire. Then we had the Greek Empire with uh, Alexander the Great. And then uh, for the longest of times, we had the Roman Empire. And you will know that the metals that are talked about in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image are the ones connected with those particular empires as well. Uh, and the production of iron uh, in particular uh, reached its zenith in the Roman Empire. It was one of the reasons why their military was particularly so strong. So we can see that the prophecy has come true up until the point at which we are with, with weak nations uh, and uh, strong nations. So what comes next? Well, verse 44, and in those days, these kings of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. We definitely haven't seen that. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And so that stone that comes up is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
uh, because it is he who's prophesied uh, that, that will destroy the world empires as they currently are and set up his kingdom. And when we go to the New Testament, we can see that's the case as well, that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised to return. And when he does return, that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to take over the whole earth and set God's kingdom up on earth. And we can see that. Uh, in, in that passage taken from Acts chapter 1. And I'll just read for the sake of time verse 11. So we've got the disciples looking up. Where else would they look? Uh, and the angels say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he's coming back. And Jesus associates himself with the prophecy uh, of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, for instance, we have, uh, again, a repetition. Uh, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away in his kingdom, the one which will not be destroyed. Well, in Matthew 24, the, the, Jesus himself says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And there are literally hundreds of references to Christ's second coming uh, in the Bible. And the point about Nebuchadnezzar's image is that we can see that all five parts of that have come true. It's, it's the last part. It's the striking of, of the whole image uh, that, that has yet to come. And that chimes in with the second coming of Christ. And then just another example in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, in verse 22, for as in Adam all will die, even so in Christ will all be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. So that gives us a great deal of hope in times when, uh, at, like now, where we see war and famine and misery and suffering. Because one of the biggest points that, uh, again, was made to Nebuchadnezzar by Daniel is that it is God who rules in the kingdoms of men and raises up the basest of men to do his bidding. And there's a picture by William Blake of Nebuchadnezzar in his madness. There are lots of other prophecies in Daniel that, that are worth uh, looking at. One is the prophecy of the four beasts, which is a replay of the image. One is the uh, about the ancient of days and the son of man and predicts the coming, the second coming of Christ. Uh, and a particularly interesting one is the 70 weeks prophecy, which prophesies, amongst other things, the date at which Jesus would, would come to the earth uh, first of all. And, and here's the thing for you. How do you think that the magi, the, the magicians from the east, from Babylon, knew when Jesus was due to be born. And I would put it to you that they had a copy of Daniel's prophecy in front of them that they'd studied and they understood the timing of that. And so they knew when to look out for something special in the, in the heavens to take them from Babylon uh, all the way to Bethlehem to go and see uh, the, the King, the Lord Jesus. So there we are. Uh, the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will, sets over it the lowest of men. That's the summary that, that actually Nebuchadnezzar gives us in Daniel chapter 4. Uh, and we can see then in this prophecy that most of it's come to pass, the rest of it will. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's one of those cornerstones of Christianity that helps us really believe the reality of the things that we do.